Okay, well, welcome everybody. Welcome to this Lunch and Learn today. My name is Renee Miller and I'm the program manager for the Oregon Bioscience Incubator. And we welcome you to this educational program on drug importation and counterfeit medicines and its impact on bioscience. And we appreciate pharma and our speakers for making this program possible. So before we forget, begin, I would like to give a land acknowledgement. OBI and Otradi would like to acknowledge the land we are all on, wherever we may be. Otradi conducts business throughout Portland and beyond and is making an effort to acknowledge the history of the area and work towards decolonization of the bioscience industry. Portland rests on traditional village sites of the Multnomah, Kathlamet, Clackamas, Chinook, Tualatin, Kalapoya, Molala, and many other tribes who have made their homes along the Columbia River. So please join us in acknowledging the land we are all on throughout Oregon and beyond. And to learn more about Oregon, uh, Portland's native diverse and vibrant community, please read Leading with Tradition, a document created by the Portland Indian Leaders Roundtable. I will put a link to it in the chat box right now. There we go. Okay, great. Well, once again, thank you for joining us. I would like to introduce our speakers today. We have three speakers. The first is Shabir Safdar. He's been with the Partnership for Safe Medicines for over a decade and was tapped to lead it in 2017. This partnership, founded in 2003, is a not-for-profit focused entirely on researching the danger of counterfeit drugs in America and educating the public about how to stay safe, safe from them. Shabir is passionate about patient safety and the dangers of counterfeits, having seen firsthand the dangers of counterfeits in countries around the world where a closed, secure drug supply chain does not exist. We also have Danny Peters, and she is president of Magnet Strategy Group, a consulting firm that manages public affairs strategies in Canada and the US. Danny serves as a principal advisor to the Alliance for Safe Online Pharmacies in Canada. The Alliance for Safe Online Pharmacies is a global nonprofit organization dedicated to combating illegal online pharmacies and falsified medicines to make the internet safer for consumers worldwide. Prior to founding Magnet Strategy Group, Danny held senior roles in public affairs firms in the US and Canada, concentrating on fields that include innovation, health, and life sciences. Danny is also the co-founder of the Cross Border Health Foundation, an organization that fosters dialogue between Canada and the United States around common health priorities. And we also have Lev Kubiak, is the Vice President and Chief Security Officer for Pfizer globally. He oversees Pfizer's security resources, whose mission is defined by these three pillars, product integrity for patient safety, fraud and asset recovery, and colleague and site security. Lev joined Pfizer in 2016 after 23 years in the Department of Homeland Security, where he directed their international operations leading over 400 law enforcement personnel operating in 47 countries from 2014 to 2016. Prior to that, he was the director of the National Intellectual Property Rights Coordination Center, the US government's task force on intellectual property and trade crime. So please welcome these knowledgeable presenters today. And if you have questions for our speakers, just put them in the chat box and they will do Q and A as we go along and also have time for Q&A at the end. So with that, Shabir, I think, are you up? Uh, I can start, yes, thank okay. you. Okay, all right, well, take it away. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Renee, for the introduction. And as she said, uh, I'm going to just keep an eye on the chat box for, for questions as we go. And I'm gonna start by asking each of, the, each of my fellow presenters, Danny and Lev, to talk a little bit about your job and, and who you are and what you do in, in ways that are not visible from the introduction that you know, usually hear read at a conference. So I'll start myself. Um, I have been studying and working on and researching counterfeit medicine in the US for over a decade. Um, I find it to be incredibly 
serious work, incredibly important public health work, sometimes scary and sometimes sad, but incredibly rewarding. Um, I work with a lot of families who have received, who've had family members who've received counterfeit pills um, quite often, but not always, not through the legal supply chain, but through other supply chains, you know, gray market or just outright illegal supply chains. And the harm is very real. So I take my job pretty seriously, but I'm also a true crime buff. So I spend a lot of time reading trial transcripts, criminal complaints, um, sentencing memos. And I spend a lot of time talking to families who've suffered these harms, be they from a counterfeit oncology medicine that their family member got and did not help them cure their cancer, to people who've, whose family members have received fake pills that had fentanyl in them. And, and they expired from the, the poisoning of the fentanyl. So it's a really interesting job. It can be tough at times, but I really do love it. And it's why I'm very serious about my, about my, my avocation here. Um, Danny, why don't you go next? Sure. Um, pleasure to be here. Thanks so much for having me. Um, so as mentioned, I work with the Alliance for Safe Online Pharmacies. And it's really, I'm very proud to be working with this organization because like Shabir, its commitment is to keeping the public safe. And um, my role at ASOP Canada is keeping Canadians safe. Um, but as, as we noted, this international uh, market of, of counterfeit pharmaceuticals, it really is an international problem and it requires collaboration um, across, across countries. And even within Canada itself, what has struck me about this particular issue is how siloed, um, how siloed it is. And that really serves as um, an area where criminals can, can take advantage. So there's, there's internet, there's law enforcement, and then there's public health and health. And in Canada also, we are um, what's called a federated health system. So if people think about single payer in Canada being one payer, and it isn't like that. It's very much a federated system. Each province has its own way of healthcare. And so that makes it even more complex when you're dealing with um, illegal online sellers and where the regulatory barriers um, settle in. Um, so another part of what I do and mentioned in my bio is, is Canada US. So I started my career working in Washington and relocated back to Canada where I'm from. So I spent a lot of time trying to find those areas of common ground between Canada and United States. And again, this is an area of, that's very important to me. The Canada US relationship is very important to me. And I think can think of no better way to work together to keep our collective uh, population safe and to hold um, bad actors accountable. I put it at risk. Thank you, Danny. Lev, tell us about yourself and your job. Yeah, I guess I'll just follow your, uh, your lead a little bit, uh, Shabir. And thanks again for everybody for uh, this discussion on this important topic. Um, so I had the great pleasure as the introduction to uh, a special agent for what was originally the U.S. Customs Service and then later became depart part of the Department of Homeland Security after 9-11 uh, happened uh, in the United States and um, spent my 23 years in law enforcement uh, really uh, fascinated by that, a bit like you, Shabir, just from a different angle in that, uh, you know, I really see a law enforcement uh, primary mission is, is being seekers of the truth and then, you know, holding those accountable for, for criminal actions or criminal activities. And, um, and so I've had the opportunity to investigate a lot of different types of crimes, but towards the end of my career, um, and at some point early on, international trade, uh, supply chain security internationally, uh, particularly after 9-11, uh, the trade and illicit goods, uh, the immense amount of financial benefits uh, that result to criminal organizations as a result of those activities were really, you know, my prior life's work. Uh, upon retiring from the federal government, I had the opportunity to join Pfizer and uh, really have been very happy with that choice uh, because uh, although I didn't know it at the time, you know, the company is very, very obviously mission focused and focused on uh, breakthroughs that change patients' lives in a really meaningful and positive way and have for over 25 years uh, dedicated resources to a program, to a product integrity program to protect patients and individuals and healthcare providers from 
uh, counterfeit medicines or counterfeit products or illicit medical products that may cause harm when, when good is intended. And we've seen, you know, significant change uh, over the years by criminal actors. You know, there was a time when they targeted primarily what I would call lifestyle enhancing products, um, but they have definitely shifted in the last five to 10 years uh, to counterfeit any and all medicines, um, including, you know, many life-saving, life-extending medicines like cancer medication. Uh, the vaccine currently, uh, we're working a lot of cases uh, related to counterfeit versions of vaccine and have helped in, in other countries, uh, law enforcement officials disrupt actual vaccination clinics where people are being, being vaccinated with counterfeit product um, while paying you know, very good money for what they believe to be a real vaccine. It's a double-edged problem because the, not only is the individual being dosed with something that they're paying for that isn't what they think it is, but then that individual is leaving the clinic, believing that they're vaccinated, and uh, you know, exposing others in the health community to additional risk as a result of that. So, um, I've always found this work uh, very fulfilling. I also have other responsibilities within the company around the company's uh, colleague and site security, and around other types of fraud uh, prevention. Um, but really, this uh, anti-counterfeiting work is my true passion, and uh, I think one of the most important topics we can consider today, as you mentioned, as we were leading up to this, you know, I, I think it shocks people that the Department of Homeland Security, my prior agency, has, uh, as of about last week, seized 23 million counterfeit N95 masks in the United States that were headed to businesses and to individuals who thought they were protecting themselves by buying these inferior products uh, and buying them out of desperation. I'm sure they weren't buying them inexpensively. Uh, I know of several state governments that were defrauded. I'm sure millions of companies around the world have been defrauded in this way. Uh, and many don't even know it or suspect it at this point. So it's a very dangerous time for counterfeits and there's huge impact. And so I'm excited about having this conversation today. Awesome, thank you. We have such esteemed colleagues. I'm actually really happy that we all get together. Um, so ostensibly, we're going to talk about counterfeit medicines and also a policy topic of importation. They are inextricably linked, which is why I actually focus on them. But let's sort of start from the first, first principles here, which is that the, the environment, and specifically to, I think, this community, the environment that fosters innovative medical therapies requires a number of things in the ecology to be successful, right? It requires probably predictable intellectual property platforms, venture funding, technology transfer from universities, et cetera. And for medical products, it requires a secure supply chain, right? You, there's no point creating innovative therapies if they can be counterfeited easily. Um, and it makes it very hard to actually either build a business or actually help people in that scenario. And so, you know, we have in this country a very strong supply chain. Some of the things I think that Americans take for granted is that, uh, is that they're, you know, they don't have to worry about the counterfeit problem here like they do in other parts of the world. And I'll give you an example. I have an, I have an aunt in Pakistan, which is where half my family is from. And she had a couple of years ago a medical problem and needed the doctor prescribed, diagnosed and prescribed a medicine. And she then took me through a stage of healthcare that we are not used to here. She said, you go and you get the medicine and then you take it for a couple of weeks and you and your doctor, if you're not responding to treatment, try and figure out, is it the wrong diagnosis, the wrong dosage, or is the medicine counterfeit? I said, that's not how healthcare is supposed to work. <laughs> And she said, that's how it works here. Like you just, you have to assume that one of the parts of your healthcare journey is to figure out if the treatment you're getting is real or not. And I said, that is awful. In the end, she actually came to St. Louis where my dad, who's an oncologist practices and got her prescription filled here and then went back. And it turns out the medicine was counterfeit. So that is an example of how the strength of our closed secure drug supply chain benefits us in ways that we don't even think about that other countries are, are appreciating when they don't have it. And that leads us to the topic of importation. One of the proposals that you hear and has been around for, I think at this point, almost 21 years 
has been to bulk import medicine from Canada. And one of the challenges of that is that that's not how medicine enters the country today. Today, if, um, if Shabir has a pharmaceutical company and he's making medicine, let's say at an inspected and regulated factory um, in Ireland, uh, I, uh, my staff or my people and my corporate entity would import that medicine ourselves, right? And which is a, a matching of incentives, right? I, I have an incentive to make sure it's the real thing. I actually supervise or actually run the factory in Ireland and I bring the medicine here. In these import schemes where like Florida would like to import pallets of medicine from Canada, they're not actually going to a Canadian manufacturer. They're actually going to a middleman somewhere in Canada to bring in those pallets of medicine. And suddenly you have a question, which is, is that middleman the right one? What we've seen so far in the pandemic is that there's a lot of middlemen who will be happy to sell you fake medical products, even though they don't exist. Um, and so that's a real challenge. And I think Lev, you, you alluded to some of, those, some of those issues. Have you seen um, people selling wholesale quantities of counterfeits around the world with intent to sell cross-border? Is that something that's a, a novel or a routine sort of event? Yeah, no, I, Shabir, it's a great, uh, great point to make. I would say a couple of, just a couple of kind of immediate thoughts. First, um, oftentimes we see wholesalers, uh, middlemen, if you will, to use an old phrase, right? Uh, the, the connectors uh, between who sometimes themselves become fooled about the legitimacy of the product that they're trading in. And so they oftentimes, and we've seen this around the United, around the world currently, where we will see governments get letters from you know, longstanding procurement individuals who are offering uh, millions of vials of Pfizer's va vaccine to the, uh, uh, an official in the Ministry of Health um, and that individual believes that he or she has access to a uh, legitimate Pfizer vaccine. But we have chased down nearly 50 of those in at least 15 different countries at this point. And in not a single instance has anyone had access to legitimate Pfizer vaccine. So you're, the third party involved can also be fooled. But I think there's an even greater risk is when you have the third party that's not fooled but is complicit. And we've seen that time and time again in all of these cases. Uh, for instance, most recently, we've had this case out of the Ukraine where a Ukrainian criminal organization intentionally set up an online pharmacy and then built a criminal enterprise around creating fake medicines with no active pharmaceutical ingredient, relabeling illicit, diverted, or expired uh, medicines with new labels so that individuals would believe that they are actually real medicines, um, and then advertising them in a myriad of ways over the internet, social media, direct to consumers, um, and then shipping them from the Ukraine uh, directly to uh, consumers all over the world and patients all over the world. And it wasn't just, as I said, you know, lifestyle, life enhancing, uh, medicines. It was uh, the first, and I have to give a tremendous amount of credit to my colleagues at Merck. Uh, it was Merck that initiated this investigation uh, because they saw counterfeit versions of their uh, industry-leading drug, Keytruda, um, which is a cancer medication. And they were unable to ascertain where these uh, counterfeits were coming from because they had no active ingredient in them at all. And they were uh, emerging in markets around the world, Brazil most notably. And ultimately through their work and then eight other pharmaceutical companies joined them in this investigation because all of us had uh, similar interests in this criminal organization uh, counterfeiting or diverting uh, illicit products uh, through the supply chain and putting patients in jeopardy around the world. Lev, can you, I guess maybe this may be a leading question, but if someone makes a fake version of, let's say, a cancer medication, and it just has saline in it, and it gets injected to, into a patient, would the patient even know the difference? No, we had 70,000 people dosed in Keto Ecuador with uh, what was supposedly a vaccine. Um, and uh, the police raided the individual 
um, no one in Quito, Ecuador had any access to any vaccines at the time that this dose of claim was coming on. There's a newer one in Mexico, uh, just south of us, and this happens quite a bit in Mexico, the supply chain. As you pointed out, uh, I'm very familiar with the Pakistan market because I have a, a member of our team stationed there doing a ton of work. Unfortunately, a lot of counterfeit operations supplying small individual pharmacies, you know, quote unquote pharmacies, they're licensed to sell medicines. And oftentimes we'll find legitimate counterfeit and expired diverted product all on the same shelf. Uh, and even the pharmacist that's selling them doesn't know what's real and what's fake. And so it's impossible for a patient to know. And so when you have, you know, either an oral dosage unit, you know, you have to remember that counterfeiters are expert at making whatever the product is, whether it's medicine or anything else, look very, very real. They do not profit in any way by making the uh, contents real. So they make the packaging look as exact and real as they can. And they, you know, they buy legitimate pill bottles in our case or vials in our case. They create very sophisticated labels because label making is cheap. And they create a pill or a product that has the same visual uh, indicators as our real product would. And they put those three things together at pennies on the dollar and sell them at you know very significant prices to unsuspecting. And, and right now in the pandemic, desperate individuals, right? People who are seeking products because they can't otherwise get access to them. Just because we're so new and so early in the pandemic, it's almost a perfect storm for counterfeiters at this point. So really, well, I mean, what we're talking about here is that there's always a criminal element that will step in, be it at the retail or wholesale level, to sell you something you want, even if it's not available. The oldest product that Pfizer had, and I said had because we didn't have it, uh, we don't have it currently, but we were the manufacturer and distributor for ChapStick for the longest period of time. And several years ago, we uncovered a counterfeit organization making uh j and J's Vaseline, our chapstick in a burned out warehouse in New Jersey and distributing it along the East Coast to every small hotel chain's front office kiosk. So when you forget your toothpaste and you go downstairs to get the toothbrush and toothpaste, they would have chapstick, Vaseline and other physical care products like that. Many of which you know were distributed in very notable hotel chains um, because the, that supply chain is very penetrable. Unfortunately for us in the United States, and it, maybe some people think this is counterintuitive for a pharmaceutical company, but we are extremely thankful for the FDA's work in making the United States' drug supply chain one of the most secure in the world. And therefore it is extremely rare that you go to a brick and mortar pharmacy or you purchase online from a notable approved pharmacy, recognized pharmacy in the United States, that you would get counterfeit uh, medicines, as you know, uh, from those products. And so the challenge I see as we get further into this discussion from importation is we're, we're taking the safest uh, distribution system the world really has and opening it up to all sorts of questionable access uh, from, from less, potentially less scrupulous individuals to supply critical medicines to individuals. So let's actually pivot a little bit to importation because it's a, a popular topic. I know that Florida has said that they're all excited about importing tons of medication from Canada. They've listed what they're going to bring in. Let's start at this from the concept of assuming it's assuming that we, we're going to deal with legitimate wholesalers. You know, Danny, what in Canada has been the reception to American states and, pol and politicians saying that we would like to import pallets of medicine that you have in your drug supply cheaply into places like Florida and Colorado? Yeah, so our, our membership of ASOP represents um, all aspects of the pharmaceutical supply chain in Canada. Um, so from our, our pharmacists, our pharmacies, our pharmacy distribution partners, um, as well as manufacturers. And um, the view is that we do not have the supply in Canada to meet the needs of the U.S. population. We are 10% uh, um, in population size of what the U.S. is. And uh, some reports suggest that our supply will be depleted within weeks if 
if all U.S. states um, went ahead with importation, even one state, the state of California population uh, equals our, our population more or less. So you can imagine the, the threat that this poses to our drug supply. And, and so as Shabir noted that um, under Florida or these states, it does require a dance partner in Canada. So it does require a wholesaler to, uh, to partner with to make those supplies available. And our wholesalers just said, we, we can't go along with this. And um, that's part of the advocacy work that we have been doing with the um, Canadian government as well as provincial authorities um, to let them know that um, it's really Canada's responsibility to um, alert uh, their counterparts in the United States that uh, these importation programs will not work. And just the point about um, counterfeiting, we are concerned in Canada, we have drug shortage challenges in Canada like other countries do. Um, we might be even more sensitive to those issues because we have um, very limited uh, production capacity for pharmaceuticals within Canada. And we get the supply that we get in the beginning of the year and that's what we get. We don't get any more than that. So if there are shortages which already exist, which have gotten worse with COVID-19, which would only be obviously further exacerbated with importation, well, where will Canadians go to access their medicines? And uh, surveys that we've performed have suggested that um, one in three Canadians would be willing to go to a sanctioned source such as, such as a, an online pharmacy that is not legitimate if it meant that it's accessing a product that they wouldn't otherwise be able to access. So it's, it's not a surprise that if you, if you rely on a certain medication, you can't find it where you're going to go and criminals are very willing to take advantage of that issue. So just to be to your point about how importation and counterfeiting, they are really uh, linked in together from our perspective, that's how we look at it. So you're telling me that the wholesale and distributor community in Canada has said that they're not interested in dealing with states like Florida who want to import medicine. Well, that means that that only leaves the sketchier part of the market. But let, let me try and make this work, right? Imagine I'm Bernie Sanders and I have extolled for a decade the cheap medicines in Canada that are just waiting for us to come bring our truck and pick them up. Mm -hmm. If we buy all of your blood thinner supply, why can't you just have turned to a factory in the suburbs of Toronto or maybe farther because that land is expensive now mm -hmm. and just say, send, make more for us. Why is that not an option? No, not just for this, but for all the shortages you're experiencing. Cause I think you've got like 1500 drugs in shortage right now, which is unheard of in the U S. Yeah. Well, what, so one is that, you know, does that manufacturing capacity exist within Canada? So that's, that's in terms of for that particular kind of drug. Um, but even if it's come and as I mentioned, also, you know, the supply that we get is 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 what we get. Uh, we don't get any more than that. We are, you know, in terms of global market size, we're about two percent, I think, of the global pharmaceutical market size. So we um, that that's an allocation that we get for that particular year. And I know this was part of the education we provided to the Canadian government too, because that was some of the questions that they had um, when when sort of importation started boiling up again. Is that you know can can you produce more? And and that the, just the nature of the global market is such that that this is not possible. Possible. And and even so, um, you know, with with importation, um, with it becoming more of a reality, um, manufacturers could preemptively um, limit supply just or just get exactly what we need um, to be able to monitor that. So even it might further provoke shortages, um, even if if importation proposals um, become more serious. Uh, are you as uh, are, and, and our patient advocates in Canada worried about the possibility of panic driven shortages if Americans start announcing plans to export large quantities of your drug supply into the U.S.? Yeah, that's actually one of the most uh primary concerns that we brought forward to the government more near term concerns because it does take time for these importation programs to potentially be set up. Um, as you noted in Florida, you, know, you need to have a partner in Canada, you need to be able to have the product go through, you know, first the program be approved by the FDA and the product go through approved. So we thought the most near term risk is Canadians seeing um, a 
elected officials in the United States or announced them saying, yay, you can, you know, import from Canada, and then it would, it would force a run on, on the pharmacies. And, um, and it seemed to be that that was also what concerned Canadian authorities as well. And uh, Levy mentioned a perfect storm. We talked about it as a perfect storm in Canada that we're in the middle of COVID-19. We already have drug shortages. And then these announcements come forward. This is not the time that we need to um, exacerbate an existing drug shortage. Well, I know that people talk about, you know, crossing the border and, you know, going to pharmacies on the near side of the U.S.-Canada border in Canada to buy medicine. Have, have you seen issues around supply that are worrisome to your regulators in, in Canada from Americans crossing the border? The, the one concern that happened was, you mentioned Bernie Sanders, was sort of these um, these caravans that were coming across the border uh, of, of in, focus on insulin. Um, so we're very sympathetic uh, to uh, to the cost of insulin um, to our American uh, friends and understand that that it, it is a quite a substantial cost difference. Um, and so there was some concern. We did hear that from some of our members and then from some of the patient groups that we've been working with, um, concerns about um, shortages potentially at, at the local level. Uh, where it's a, a concern is maybe these smaller towns, these smaller border towns, again, where they might have a certain supply that they have, and then it might take a week or so for that to be replenished. But the larger threat really is on, you know, the bulk importation is, is the real uh, concern for us. And then also these, what we call internet brokers that are not regulated um, and that are um, able to source supply from different pharmacies across the country and fulfill single, you know, personal importation, but they aggregate those orders and, and we believe that creates a real risk to our drug supply in Canada. I understand. Let's talk a little bit about the Canadian, the Canadian response, right? This debate's been going on a long time. Last year, uh, the last administration in the White House uh, moved to finality a regulation that would explain to states in the U.S., like Florida, like Colorado, how a program they would set up to bulk mm -hmm. import medicine from Canada would work. So what did the Canadians say about that? Because <laughs> that seems it seems like that was made final and states like Florida and Governor DeSantis are still quite enthusiastic about the idea. Do you, did the Canadians do anything or say anything in response to that? Yeah, they did. So in terms of saying things, uh, there were statements made by our um, our ambassador, um, our ambassador to the United States, um, who made statements um, and, and had, had meetings with the White House to explain um, concerns um, from Canada and, and particularly the challenges that we have with respect to supply, existing shortages and the challenges due to COVID-19. But even further, the Canadian government and Health Canada, which is our, our regulator, um, our health regulator, um, put forward what's called an interim order um, at the end of November. And the interim order was essentially established to prevent bulk exports of pharmaceuticals from Canada to the United States. Um, it, it, what it does is it has much greater oversight over um, wholesalers um, that, um, that, that do distribute pharmaceutical products. Um, we'd say it's it's a, it's a pretty good measure for Canada to uh, to demonstrate that they mean business, um, and they have also indicated that in, in in public statements that all options are on the table. Um, they did respond when FDA did an open uh, consultation on the final rule. Um, they they did respond to that. And they did indicate that that all options are on the table if it means protecting the Canadian drug supply. Okay, so. Maybe we just aren't listening very well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm going to communicate the message. <laughs> well, let's let's talk a little bit about security, right? We we've talked we've talked about counterfeiters, counterfeiter wholesalers. I'm I'm not even going to ask you the question that should be obvious, which is that all those websites I see in Google that claim to be Canadian pharmacies that would ship me medicine, those aren't really Canadian, are they? Most of them are not. Most of them, some of them might be, but still not following all the rules. So yeah. uh, they might not be health can approved products. One of the one of the enhancements to security that we have in the U.S. I think that most people don't even know about. In fact, many of the pharmacists I educate are not familiar with um, is the track and trace system, and it's it's a ten year long rollout, and it was actually based upon a case 
that was profiled uh, in this book, Dangerous Doses, about an outbreak we had in the early 2000s in America, in South Florida, of two products called Procrit and Epigen. And after a lot of false starts, they finally figured out in 2013 that we needed to basically serialize every medicine. And so I'm going to go to you with this one, Lev, which is, can you tell us in, in a, in a in a small synopsis for those of us who are not wholesaling experts, um, you know, track and trace, what, what does it do? You know, how would I, how would I maybe see it if I was in a pharmacy looking at their inventory? What would it, what would it look like? Yeah. So in really simple terms, track and trace is a system or a process uh, which allows one, or allows the government really to determine a drug's current and past locations. So where was it made, where was it transferred through, and where is it ultimately distributed from? Um, where track and trace is implemented correctly, and that's a big if because this is in a very different stage all over the world, a drug can be traced throughout the supply chain and traced back up the supply chain in the case of uh, recall or uh, some sort of other issue or concern that the government may have. Serialization was then subsequently created in the pharmaceutical industry to help authenticate some of the medicines within that track and trace system um, is, I guess, a, a general quick summary for us. And so it allows uh, serialized product to be authenticated by the individual that needs to authenticate it. So in, in a pharmacy's case, the pharmacist at the pharmacy could authenticate through the, the saleable unit, which sometimes is a bottle, sometimes it's a carton, sometimes it's a lot of things, um, that that is actually an authentic product distributed by, in our case, Pfizer, let's say. Uh, however, um, you know, pharmacies in the United States further redistribute. So a patient coming in may only be prescribe 10 pills uh, from that bottle and the bottle may contain 250 pills. When you're getting that uh, from a pharmacist, the pharmacist has hopefully validated that the product is real, but there's no way for the patient to validate that. And so uh, because the pharmacist has the ability and because those systems in the legitimate supply chain are in place, there's a very high degree of confidence in the United States and other countries like Canada that that final unit at the pharmacy distributed by a pharmacist is actually contains real medicine. However, so many of us, and I think this is a greater risk right now during the pandemic, so many of us have turned to buying everything off the internet. The United States government, not related specifically to this, but the United States government found uh, in a study two years ago that 40% of everything they bought off of Amazon was counterfeit. Um, and so when you think about everything that people are buying off of the internet right now and our, you know, our own protective aversion to going into public places like farms, like your brick and mortar for CVS right now, um, there's a really high propensity for people to search out things online. And if you don't have a deep understanding of this process like the three of us do, um, the, the websites that purport to be Canadian pharmacies, and they're all designed that way when they face the United States to a U.S. Google search, they all look like they're Canadian pharmacies. You know, I think the stats are 96% of those do not meet regular US regulatory authority. And so the, the likelihood of getting a legitimate medicine off of the internet is something, you know, I tell all of my friends and family, do not buy your medicines off of the internet outside of an authorized brick and mortar pharmacy. So if you go to CVS, then I'm okay with you buying it off of CVS's website, right? But you should know that that brick and mortar store actually exists and that there is a process there to ensure that you're getting safe medicines. And we've seen time and again that these purportedly Canadian farm, and they're, they're beautifully done. The criminal organization puts a ton of money into web design. And you know what most people don't know is the same criminal organization may own a thousand Canadian looking pharmacies and they will price the product at a thousand different prices, knowing that you will shop, if you're the average American, five websites, and almost 100% of the time, purchase the cheapest one of the five that you can find, that you search. And that criminal organization knows that, so they stagger the prices, 
in such a way that it looks like you're buying it from a different website and you're getting it delivered directly to your house, what could be easier, except that oftentimes it's a counterfeit product that could, in the worst case, it does nothing other than not treat your disease. And we've seen that. But in the most egregious cases, of you, as you've seen, Shabir, you know, fentanyl laced products, uh, contaminated products that actually result in somebody's death. Yeah. So the track and trace program, which we're eight years into a 10 year rollout, right? It was a long process, right? To get every part of the supply chain to start by putting a, bar, a serialized number and a 2D barcode on every unit of sale on the factory floor, that alone must have been a Herculean effort for every manufacturer like yourselves and others. And then to get every every FedEx, every shipping UPS, every logistics supplier, every wholesaler, and then every pharmacy, which is the part that hasn't come yet, to have the ability to scan and store that unique number of that one bottle or one box. So that's an amazing effort. And the fact that we actually today, I think except for grandfathered inventory, all pharmacy shelf inventory today is, has been serialized. And the fact that only eight years into a 10 year rollout that that's where we are, I think is kind of amazing. And again, it's one of those technologies that works when it works well, you don't even know it exists and maybe don't appreciate it. Let's talk about Canada. Danny, the, where is Canada in terms of their implementation of a track and trace program? What is it? Is there a track and trace program in Canada? So we don't currently have a track and trace program in Canada. Um, there have been efforts to advocate for one, and and it's it's something that's um, you know been a proposal that's been put forward, to my understanding, um, but it has not um, not been implemented. And this also speaks to the the nature of our of our health system as well. I mentioned in my in my opening comments that um, we have a uh, we don't have a, a single payer at the federal level. Um, so and that's regulated though by Health Canada, our version of, of the FDA. But our health systems are very much a provincial run uh, in nature. And so we, um, some, some of those challenges are going to happen within prevent federal provincial um, coordination, which, which stands as a barrier. So currently we do not have a track and trace system. So I feel like that means that if we buy a medicine from a wholesaler who claims to have Canadian medicine and may or may not even be a Canadian wholesaler, but mm -hmm. there's no way for us to double check, right? There's no barcode to scan in anywhere in the Canadian drug supply to tell us mm -hmm. that this is traceable like it would be in the US. Would that be right? That's correct. Yeah. Well, that's a little concerning. <laughs> let's let's take another route in which medicines make their way, might make their way through Canada into the US. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I, ha I have worked with gentlemen who work in Canadian uh, Customs and Border Protection, and they mm -hmm. talk about this concept of transshipping where a package mm -hmm. will come to Canada and then continue on to the US, but doesn't necessarily mm -hmm. pass customs. Mm -hmm. um, that package would look like it was coming from Canada when I received it here in California, let's say. Mm -hmm. is, it, is it the case that I can depend upon Health Canada to inspect anything going through being transshipped through Canada before it comes here, for example, looking for counterfeit medicine? Is that, is that something that Health Canada does or the, the Canadian Mounties do? No, uh, no, they don't. And um, if it's transshipped, they don't have a responsibility to um, do the checking. So either yeah, Canadian, Canadian Border Services Agency um, or Health Canada um, or, or the RCMP. Um, and in fact, our, um, our, our, uh, the, our, our, an organization that represents all of our pharmacy regulators um, at the provincial level, um, did write a letter to Congress a few years ago um, with that exact point that said that our um, our law enforcement authorities um, cannot be held responsible for uh, pharmaceuticals that are transshipped through Canada. Okay, not Shabira. that you don't love us, but you don't have a lot of money to to hire police to do that. I get that. Lev, yeah. you wanted to say something. Yeah, I'll just comment that without reason, no one does that. No one in the world. Uh, yeah. We don't do it in the United States. They don't do it in Mexico. Transship goods are simply that. They're products that it's cheaper and easier for the transportation company to move by land or rail or across country during some part of its journey. 
to in enter one port and exit another for a myriad of reasons, right? And they're, and they're all transportation related. Absent, uh, you know, I spent 23 years with the Department of Homeland Security, absent information that says, hey, there's something wrong with that shipment, either a request from a foreign government or something else. Uh, we don't inspect transship goods either, unless we think there's a reason to inspect transship goods. And so uh, it's not something simply Canada doesn't do, it's something none of us do. And having spent 10 years on the shared border between Canada and the United States, I'm very defensive of my CBSA brethren and sister. Mm -hmm. So I want to make sure that no one leaves thinking that Canada isn't doing the right thing. It's a right. function of how you prioritize your resources as a customs organization anywhere in the world. And, and is it the case, Lev, that, that Transshipping and sort of free trade zones like this are are used by organized crime to to move counterfeits around the world. Yeah, uh, to move counterfeits, to move any illicit products. Um, it's it's uh, I, I investigated a case many years ago where uh, someone imported wire hangers from China to the United States, transshipped them from a port in the West Coast through the United States to Mexico. They went into Mexico where they were relabeled as made in Mexico and then re-entered into the United States duty-free. And that's because there was a duty on Chinese hangers into the United States for the dry cleaning industry, but no duty on a hanger made in Mexico for the United States. And it shows you the extent to which people will go to avoid um, you know, it was a couple of pennies uh, per hanger, but when you talk about bulk shipments, so if you're willing to do that for a wire hanger for the dry cleaning industry, you're certainly willing to do it for a counterfeit product that nets literally, you know, there's a famous study out of uh, the University of I think Bonn uh, in Germany that, that, that in 2008, I think the dates back to, showed that a 1,000 euro investment in counterfeit medicine production capability would yield 500,000 euro in profit for the criminal organization. So the amount of money that you can make as a criminal group uh, affords you tremendous capability to uh, create medicines cheap, you know, fake medicines cheaply, and then to advertise them in a very sophisticated manner so that no one can tell the difference. So it's, uh, it's even difficult for experts, sometimes even in our labs, we have trouble telling the real from the fake until we test it as a, as a product. Yeah. Well, let's actually stick with law enforcement for a second. You know, you mentioned before this case involving the Ukrainian counterfeiters. And one of the big concerns that I hear law enforcement express and also boards of pharmacy express when they look at these importation ideas that Florida wants to do is that it is challenging to imagine actually bringing someone on foreign soil to justice in America, if they were to sell us counterfeit medicine, maybe disguised as Canadian, for example, what sort of, maybe you can use the Ukrainian case as an example, or maybe there's some other cases, you know, what are, what are the challenges in bringing to justice in America, someone who is a foreign national on foreign soil? And has the pandemic given us any examples of the difficulty of doing that? Yeah, sure. Um, so my last job in government service for two years was supervising uh, the special agents for the Department of Homeland Security that serve in embassies around the world, specifically for the purpose, they don't have any law enforcement authority in those countries. So if we have a uh, U.S. government entity in Ottawa, let's say at the U.S. embassy there, uh, they don't have any law enforcement authority in Canada, but their job is to partner with Canadian law enforcement at the federal provincial, tribal, and uh, local levels and collect evidence jointly on investigations anytime there is a shared criminal activity. And the more countries you can touch, the more obfuscated you can make your international supply chain. And the easier it is to move product and, and to uh, re-authenticate, uh, if you will, right? To give false provenance, if you will, to your product as it moves around the globe. Um, and so the challenges are collecting evidence on every one of those steps, right? So through as it, as it transfers from country to country, there's yet another element to the crime that you need to prove and you need to be able to develop. Secondly, then you have to look at what the judicial requirements are in each of those jurisdictions, those countries. 
in the Ukrainian case, for instance, there is no extradition treaty between the Ukraine and the United States. And so uh, two individuals associated with that criminal organization were arrested in the United States because they attempted to sell counterfeit products into the United States. They wanted to establish a, a more stronger market here and Homeland Security Investigations, one of the premier law, federal law enforcement agencies that works on counterfeit investigations consistently, uh, lured those individuals into the United States, arrested them, and then subsequently they were sentenced here. Um, we did have success with Ukrainian authorities also arresting members of the criminal organization in the Ukraine. But typically sentences in other parts of the world are not as significant as they are in the United States. And oftentimes the, the crime, uh, the, the, the results of the criminal prosecution are uh, greatly outstripped by the profits that the individuals made along the way. And so um, in the case of those two individuals, had they been arrested in the Ukraine, they never would have come to justice in the United States. It's only because they were lured here because of that activity. We do have an extradition treaty for Canada, for instance, and we've used that in counterfeiting cases. Um, but there's interesting nuances there as well. If a Canadian citizen can be tried for a similar crime in Canada and has committed those crimes, the Canadian government's preference is to try them and keep their citizens in country and not extradite them to another foreign jurisdiction to face pressures. So, so depends on the severity of the crime. So you're telling me that with these Ukrainians that were that were counterfeiting life-saving medication across like eight different companies, the only reason we got them into a U.S. court was they were greedy enough to come to a meeting with undercover agents in the U.S. If they had not decided that that was something that they wanted to do, we they would never have seen the inside of a U.S. court because there's no extradition. Yeah, I mean, look, greedy is a is an interesting term. Yes, I think, but I would just put it in pure business terms, right? There are very few crimes that are committed for any reason other than financial. Uh, I can think of a couple: uh, child exploitation and uh, terrorism um, are two that are, are are often not associated with financial uh, activity. All other crimes and almost all other forms. The criminal's pure objective is to amass as much financial wealth as possible. And in these kind of schemes, you do that by creating a, a solid global international distribution market. And so like any other business, criminals travel from country to country. They present their goods uh, to potential buyers and they look to establish a, a significant market in each of those countries where they can sell their product at a profit. And these criminals did exactly that. They were expanding their market internationally. They saw an opera, what they thought was an opportunity to expand their market in a very significant way in the United States with a new partnership. And they flew here thinking they were meeting with other criminals that would further uh, engage them. And what they met were law enforcement officials from Homeland Security Investigations instead, thankfully. Well, I, I love that case. We did a whole we did a whole video about that case because of what I thought was just really great police work, undercover police work that lasted months, and in every aspect of it was clever from moving their conversations to Gmail that allowed them to read their mail after they got a warrant to luring them to the U.S. So I I think that's a great example of some really good counterfeiting anti counterfeiting police work. And Shabir, I think we also just have to call out the Ukrainians, uh, the Ukrainian prosecutors and law enforcement. The case has been very difficult. A lot of companies are engaged, but uh, you know, but for their initial activities and the search warrants and arrest warrants and work that they did, this case never would have gotten to the point that we could have then subsequently uh, lured people into the U.S. So uh, lots of international collaboration here. So let's talk a little bit about, about this, again, this idea, and maybe this will be the last point before we look for any other questions and wrap up, but it feels like this idea of bulk importing medicine from overseas, be it Canada or as now Bernie Sanders says, from any of the OECD countries, it's like we've had a dry run through the pandemic because my, 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 my experience of the pandemic is watching states and counties and even the federal government look anywhere they could for medical supplies, be they masks or cotton swabs or pipettes or anything else that were in short supply as we suddenly needed to ramp up all this material. And 
Operation Stolen Promise has been a, a project of federal law enforcement that has done an enormous amount of good chasing fraudsters who have been defrauding Americans and American states of tens of millions of dollars of, of counterfeit goods or just outright, you know, pretending I'm going to send you masks and then sending you nothing. But have we seen challenges, Lev? Have you seen federal law enforcement struggle with the with with some of these overseas criminals and bringing them into U.S. courtrooms? Is this a is this a can has this have you seen this be a, a problem so far in the pandemic? Yeah, I would say it's always a problem. Uh, it's exasperated by the pandemic because, um, well, first of all, just because of the pandemic, right? Uh, every job, to include law enforcement authorities' jobs. And a shout out to our, you know, our, our men and women in uh, in law enforcement around the world who are continuing to process cargo and people and and arrest people despite the you know the challenges and risks to themselves in this space. Um, there is always a challenge in in an international investigation in getting get, gathering evidence, uh, identifying the criminal act actors, and then depending on what the relationship is between the United States or what the criminal laws are, uh, a lot of times we see that company, countries won't even, uh, don't criminalize counterfeits in many uh, situations. And so if it's not a crime in that foreign country, um, oftentimes the law enforcement agencies will not support an investigation in that area unless you can really articulate that. So yes, I think, you know, short answer is these are difficult cases to work. Um, they're really important and meaningful because of the impact on patient health and safety. And so I think you see a lot of dedicated effort from, from criminals. But uh, when you, as soon as you allow your supply chain to be part of an international larger supply chain and you can't hold big pharmaceutical companies or big wholesalers responsible, the, uh, the ability to uh, have consequences for illegal actions is, is much more difficult. That is a good place to, to, to top it off. And let me actually just go to Danny for one final thought, Renee, if you'll buy us one minute. <laughs> Absolutely. Danny, what, as a Canadian and as a patient advocate for, for the security of, of, of healthcare in Canada, sympathetic to what Americans may be going through, what would you say to Americans who maintain that the answer to the problems in our healthcare system, of which the cost of pharmaceuticals is just 20%, what would you say to Americans concerned about this who think that the answer is buying pallets of medication from Canada? Here, but you're on mute. <laughs> I'm going to answer with that. <laughs> Welcome to 2021. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, I would say that from a Canadian perspective, as, as you said, we're, we're very sympathetic. We, um, you know, we were trusted neighbors in the United States. We'd say that our supply just isn't available to support the needs of the U.S. population. So we would respectfully request that our American colleagues uh, look for other other means to um, address uh, drug pricing concerns. Uh, but um, you know, securing supply from the Canadian population significantly puts us at risk. So we would ask that you look for other ideas. I feel like the Canadians should have a last word. Renee, back to you. <laughs> oh, this was really fascinating. I could have listened to this for a lot longer. Just really, really fascinating. Um, thank you so much. Thank you guys. Um, it was just really, really interesting topics and a lot of information that I certainly didn't know. And I don't know about the rest of our audience, but I, I suspect we all learned some things today. So um, I'm going to just ask people to open up their mics and, um, and video cameras if they want and ask any questions. And um, really quick, I'm going to put up a poll just a survey poll for our audience to fill out while they're coming up with any questions. Um, yeah, this was a really great topic and I, uh, I'm just really appreciative of Shabir and Danny and Lev for uh, their expertise, knowledge and, and all the different examples of what, you know, counterfeit medicines and beyond that, you know, even counterfeit, like you said, masks and swabs and all kinds of things that um, somebody might not have considered when we were talking about importation of items that could be counterfeit. 
Anyone, do you have questions? If you do, please open up your mics. And if not, we'll, um, we'll close up here in just a couple of minutes. I, um, I, this is just a really great topic and I appreciate you all for being here. And, and I really appreciate Pharma for sponsoring this event and putting it together. And I'm gonna go ahead and close the polling now. This program has been recorded, and so you can look for it in your email tomorrow. I will send it out. Um, do you have a question, Delara? Um, I do. I was going to ask about, um, you know, where these counterfeit medicines are being produced and uh, which countries they usually target, because I know uh, African countries are more vulnerable compared to, you know, United States, Canada, or European Union countries. Um, so in terms of like, um, the research that you've conducted before, um, can you tell me where these counterfeit medicines are being produced and how they reach uh, vulnerable countries? Thank you. I feel that's a great question for Lev. <laughs> okay, yeah, happy to answer. Um, so I thank you very much for the question, Delora. Um, I think there's a huge misperception the counterfeit medicines are not made in developed nations. And that is a significant threat and problem. Uh, Shabir, if you visit uh, Shabir's website, um, you will see uh, story after story, unfortunately, of uh, counterfeit medicines made in the United States uh, by small uh, manufacturing organizations. They oftentimes look like prescription medicines that uh, are laced with fentanyl. And we're seeing, unfortunately, literally hundreds of kids, generally high school and college kids, uh, getting access to those pills unknowingly. And literally a small dosage unit of that pill will kill uh, the individual the kid and has. And so I, I'll leave this with one message. Um, you know, If you have any elderly people in your family that have access to the internet and are buying their medicines, you need to talk to them after this because there is a high probability some Pfizer colleagues have uh, taken this message and found out that their own parents were buying counterfeit medicines online. Um, if you have kids, uh, young high school, grade school even, unfortunately, right now, uh, and definitely college, uh, you really need to make sure that they're aware that, uh, you know, the Xanax or the uh, any of the medicines that they see typically um, can actually kill them literally with one pill. You know, I, I grew up in a, you know, I, didn't get involved in drugs myself, thankfully, but I grew up in a culture where you could test things in college and high school and usually not die from them. Uh, that is not the case, unfortunately, today. Uh, but we do see, you know, massive manufacturing organizations in China, India, Pakistan. Um, and we do see, as you, as you say, Delora, uh, much more susceptibility to, and, and as Shabir's initial Pakistan example showed, um, quite often it's impossible for people to even expect that they would get a real medicine over the counter. Um, you know, I've heard people in Africa say that uh, they understand that there's a high probability that the medicines they're taking and have access to are actually counterfeit, but they're hoping there's at least some active pharmaceutical ingredient inside of them. I think that's the saddest thing in the world, particularly in the middle of a pandemic. And so uh, they're made all over the world in, in massive quantities. They're shipped internationally throughout the world. They're diverted from country to country, unfortunately, through an illicit marketplace sometimes. Um, and so it's really, it's all access, but I don't think that we can, can, we used to be able to say, hey, that really doesn't happen in developed countries. But unfortunately, we see it more in developed countries now because there's more profit to be made here because we have more money. And so we see a lot of counterfeiting in the UK, a lot of counterfeiting in the US and Canada. Um, and a lot of importation of those drugs uh, because they can make, and with, with the oncology medicines, I think it's particularly targeting countries like that now, um, where there's a lot of high uh, income individuals and people can can pay for medicines that they suspect to be real but cheaper. I think I would also, Delara, direct you to um, this. There's two therapeutic areas which have been absolutely tragic in terms of counterfeiting, both in sub-Saharan Africa and then in Southeast Asia. Um, which is malaria, counterfeit anti-malarials and counterfeit TB medication. And the WHO has actually found um, that there has been development of treatment resistant malaria 
as a result of subtherapeutic doses of counterfeit treatments. So one of those scenarios where you know you just annoy the disease, you don't actually kill it, and it learns how to be resistant. And that right there is a tragedy um, that we've actually ended up with a worse version of malaria or a worse version of TB because of counterfeiting than we would have had if we'd just been able to get through the supply chain real medicine to real patients. Um, and it's not a problem that solved a, a great deal of the problem in Southeast Asia is armed conflict that interferes with the supply chain. Um, but in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, there's also a decent amount of corruption that's a problem as well. Wow, thank you so much. That's, this, is, um, this is amazing information and we all need to be very aware. And I, I liked um, the point about, you know, talk to your kids, talk to your parents. Um, when a friend says, hey, I'm, I'm getting my, my drugs, you know, on the internet for cheaper, talk to them about it. Um, Maddie, you have a question? Yeah, you know, I, I feel very privileged to be in the United States where there is something I can do <laughs> as a consumer, but I'm really wondering about, you know, consumers in other countries. Is there, is there anything that they can do? I mean, it, it seems like in, in many cases, this has really infiltrated the, the, you know, what would hopefully be a legitimate supply chain. Um, let me try and, and take a shot at that. Danny, certainly jump in if you want to. Um, in the U.S., um, we almost never see counterfeits in the legitimate supply chain. There, it, doesn't, it does happen, and I can point to some tragic examples of it, but a licensed pharmacy, which is licensed at the state level by your board of pharmacy, your state board of pharmacy, it's a very safe outlet, as is a hospital. You know, we had from 2008 to 2012, an outbreak of counterfeit oncology medication that was shipped to, into the US by several rings one of which was a licensed Canadian wholesaler, sadly enough, which did not did no honor to his countrymen. And those medicines were almost exclusively not found in pharmacies or hospitals. They were only sold to physicians who were going online and trying to make a few extra bucks by buying cheap Avastin and giving it to patients. So I think in terms of what you can do, as long as you don't skirt the supply chain and you go to a bricks and mortar pharmacy or it's online equivalent or a hospital, um, you're going to be fine. You're yeah, not going to endanger I was, yourself. I was actually curious about uh, consumers who are not in the United States. Mm. You know, we're talking about obviously <laughs> Sub-Saharan Africa, other places. It's, yeah. it's a much, much different picture. Is there is there anything that the consumer can do or is this really a broader, a broader you know, institutional problem mm. or industry problem? I can, I can talk about, I don't, I can't necessarily speak to Sub-Saharan Africa, but what we're doing in Canada is we're trying to encourage victims to report. Um, so um, something that Lev talked about, about you know, one of the challenges for law enforcement is building evidence. And so what we, through our discussions with law enforcement, as they said, if you encourage reporting, um, that that can allow uh, law enforcement to put together the pieces and to hold the bad actors accountable. And the way to do that is actually to follow the money. So if, if um, you have purchased your uh, medication using um, a credit card, um, what's called a debit card, or even through your bank, uh, you might be able to follow the money and locate the merchant account um, where that money was taken. And it's not perfect, but at least it, it does provide a trail for law enforcement to collect evidence and hold the backers accountable. And it does specifically seen cases in Canada where um, it has allowed Canadian law enforcement to collaborate with law enforcement in other countries um, and to shut down those merchant accounts. And basically it sends a signal, um, at least in Canada, saying we're not open for business. And so if all countries kind of follow a similar kind of um, approach, um, at least it, it, it sends a message that um, this is in the welcome place for, for your counter operation. Maddie, I have some friends and family in Iran, and I have heard the story before, and this is not, this is not a panacea for, for safety, but they will sometimes at the pharmacist have a choice of medicines from different drug supplies. And so there's an Iranian made product and maybe a German made product. And their, their way of keeping themselves safe is always to try and buy a product from a regulatory system they trust, which is sometimes not the Iranian regulatory system. 
that being said, of course, counterfeiters can counterfeit any kind of packaging. So there's no telling. I think, I think there really isn't a lot of great advice for on the front end, trying to keep yourself safe in countries that don't, that, in which you're not sure you trust the closed secure drug supply chain. And I wish there was, but I'm sorry that, that I don't have better advice for you. This is just fascinating. What a, I mean, it's a, it's a terrible problem, but it's also, it's, it's a fascinating one. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, I think we're going to have to wrap up. We're a little bit over time. Um, thank you. Thank you, Shabir and Danny and Lev had to drop off for another meeting. Um, thank you, Pharma. We really appreciate having you here today and all of your good information. Thank you much. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thanks for your support of the Oregon Bioscience Incubator and go forth and have a really great rest of your week. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye.